I didn't get a uh, I didn't get an Ecclesiastes uh, illustration on the way in this morning, so God gave it to me now. <laughs> Everything in this life is hebel, right? That's our key word in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's a word that's often translated vanity or meaningless, but it literally means a mere breath or a vapor. Uh, hebel means that the, these, the things of this life, of this world, are fading away. They don't last long. They have no real substance. We try to grasp onto them and hang onto them, but it, it's like trying to hold on to smoke, or it's like trying to capture the wind in your hands. And so God gives us little uh, reminders here like, yeah, your microphone is failing. It's dying. Uh, this is the world that we live in. Oh, we're going to, okay, I'm going to keep talking while we're getting hooked up here. If, if you're new with us this morning or you're coming in, this is our fifth uh, sermon in, in this series. I really want to encourage you to go to our Facebook page, our web page, or our YouTube page, and really it's important that you listen to the introduction to the book of Ecclesiastes to really understand where this is going. So if you haven't heard the first in the series, please listen to that uh, moving forward. Uh, as we come this morning, we're going to be looking at uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, uh, verses uh, six, uh, 16 through chapter 4, verse 6. So if you want to turn there, we'll, we'll get there in just a few moments. Let me, let me switch over here. So one of the main things we want to understand as we go through Ecclesiastes is that King Solomon is, is answering the question, how do you live well in this world under the sun. And he uses that phrase under the sun to mean this, this life that we have horizontally. He's looking at life as if God is not in the picture. What if there was no God? How do we live? How do we make the best of this life that we can? Of course, he keeps bringing in God because you can't have a good life without God in it. But he's looking at life, especially from the standpoint of people who say that there is no God or God doesn't exist. And that creates a lot of problems and frustration, doesn't it? One of the things that I hope that Ecclesiastes is going to do for us is it is going to equip us to talk to the vast majority of people, the vast majority of people in our society, in our own community right here, who are living without God being calculated into their lives, right? Right? They may say that God exists, but in a very practical way, they're living every moment of every day without God factoring into their life and into their decisions. And so most people are living what? Lives of frustration, lives of heartache because they're saying this world is messed up. And Solomon tackles that question and he says, yes, this world is messed up, but here's how we should live because of that. So we come this morning to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, uh, beginning at verse 16. Remember last week was that beautiful passage on <coughs> God setting the times. There's a time for birth and a time for death. There's a time for laughter. There's a time for crying. And that little dash that we talked about, everything that's in between birth and death, God has set those times and he's sovereign and he's in control. So Solomon comes on this morning then to chapter 3 verse 16 and he says this moreover I saw under the sun that in the place of justice even there there was wickedness and in the place where there should be righteousness even there was wickedness I said in my heart God will judge the righteous and the wicked because for them is a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them, that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of men and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so does the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity, all is smoke, all is a mere breath. Everyone goes to one place. All are created from the dust, and to the dust all return. And who knows whether the spirit of a man goes upward, and the spirit of a beast goes down into the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot in life. 
Who can bring him to see what will happen after him? Again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. On the side of the oppressors there was power, and there was no one to comfort the oppressed. And I thought about the dead who are already dead. How much more fortunate than the living who are still alive. But better than both of them is he who has not yet been born and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under this sun. Then I saw all the toil and the skill and work that comes from a man's envy of his neighbor. And this is also smoke and vapor, a mere breath, trying to catch the wind in your hands. The fool folds his, an, his hands and eats his own flesh. Better is a handful of quietness than two handfuls of toil and trying to catch the wind. Heavenly Father, these are your words. We gather together this morning because your words are truth. Even when your words are a hard word, especially when your words are a hard word, we need to hear from you this morning, Heavenly Father. Help us to understand what it is that you would have us to know about you and about this life, and Lord, about us. For we pray now that your Holy Spirit may speak to us this morning, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. One in three girls in Uganda is sexually abused before they turn 15 years old. If you think that sex, sex trafficking is a problem, In our country, which it is, it's a huge problem. It's a massive problem in Africa. We look at the headlines every day. I just pulled up the headlines this morning, saw a couple in Texas, mom and dad, who are facing prison because they abused their one-month-old baby until it died. We, we, we see in Uganda, we saw in Rwanda a few years ago, we see other places, genocide, where one group of people is trying to kill, literally wipe off the face of the earth, another group of people because they're not the right kind of people. Man's inhumanity to man, as, Pober, as poet Robert Burns called it, is almost limitless, isn't it? The evil that occurs under this sun that that people do to one another, and I brought up some of the examples of children because that's one that really seems to pique our ire, doesn't it? It's one thing for people to hurt others and oppress them and and, and to see injustice, but when we see it happening to children, it's it's infuriating. And and it raises uh, a, a question for us. It raises a question for us, and and not only for us, but it raises, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I want to, here's what he says. In this passage, you should have noticed three words, injustice, oppression, and envy. This is not all-inclusive of all the wickedness that happens in this world. But Solomon is saying, as he looked around the world, remember his searches for meaning, his searches for significance in life. Why are we here? What, what is the purpose? And he says, as I look around, and, and how do I live well in this life? Here's what I see. I see injustice. What is injustice? Injustice is not getting what is right, what, what is due to you. We think of Solomon said, in the places where there should be justice, there's injustice. What's he referring to? He's referring to places like the courts. Well, that doesn't happen, right? You always get justice when you go to court, don't you? No, increasingly, it, it, it wasn't so much so in our country until the last few years. Now, now you could say it, it's crazy the, the injustice that is happening where a, a jury or a judge can, can totally ignore the laws and totally ignore justice and just do whatever they want to do. One of the headlines I looked at this week is a judge has, uh, I believe it was in the state of Georgia, a judge has been kicked off or kicked out of the courtroom by the other judges in that state because they said she has rampantly ignored the law. She literally is just making verdicts that are contradictory to the law. She's no longer allowed to be a judge. That's fellow judges that said she's done. 
she's got to go. That's injustice. I, I mention Uganda because I'm familiar with it. As some of you know, I work there uh, a couple times a year with the Hope Centers for Children of Africa. And it's always interesting to learn the cultural things. In Uganda, if you have a problem, the last place that you want to go is to court. Ugandans avoid court at all costs. Because, and I said, really? Because we've seen things happen and talked about and we're like, oh, they should take them to court and they should do this. And they go, why would anybody ever want to go to court? They said, do you know what happens when you go to court? He who has the most money wins every single time. And who am I working with? I'm working with the poor. I'm working with the oppressed. In, in Uganda, if you see an accident... What happens is the two people involved in the accident quickly get together and they begin to discuss and they begin to say, it was your fault, no, it was your fault. And, and eyewitnesses gather around and, and they'll, they'll talk loudly, loudly and they'll argue this out and they'll hash it out before the police get there because they want to settle it out of court. They want to settle it before the authorities get involved because once the authorities get involved, there will be no justice there will be no fairness. There will be nothing but oppression. Wow. Solomon said, I look around and I, where I should see justice, I see injustice. He said, where I should see people taking care of people, I, I see oppression. What is oppression? Oppression is when a person in power uses their power to take advantage, to take things, or to um, put hardships on those who have less power. And what is envy? Envy that Solomon mentions is it's close to jealousy, but envy is actually more evil than jealousy. Jealousy is seeing that something that someone else has and wanting it for yourself. Oh, you've got a nice car. I want a nice car. That's jealousy. Envy ramps it up another step. Envy says, I not only want what you have, I deserve what you have and you don't. I don't understand why you got this because you don't deserve it. You're not good. This really should be mine. There's an old proverb that I really like that says, any friend, any friend can join you in your successes and your blessings. But only a, tr I'm sorry, any friend can join you in your trials and difficulties, can share with you. But only a true friend can celebrate with you in your successes. You get it? Isn't that good? You see, when you go through a trial or difficulty, any one of your friends can come alongside and say, man, that stinks. Been there, done that. I know what it's like to hurt. I, I know what it's like to have things go bad. But a true friend can see you be blessed, whether it's in possessions or in this life or in other things, and not be what? Envious. <laughs> but to really celebrate with you and say, good on you. Good for you that you've got this, that you've been blessed, that this is coming to your life without in your heart going like, but why not me? <laughs> Why, why am I not being blessed? Why am I? I think that's a great saying. Yeah, I can join you in your hurting. I can join you in your difficulties. But can I celebrate with you? Can I rejoice? Can I stay away from that evil sin of envy? And so Solomon says, I, I look around the world and this is what I see. Injustice and oppression and envy. And it raises then a question, doesn't it? It, it raises... The big question. Does anybody know what the big question is? In light of what we just talked about, this is a question that Christians ask, but this is especially a question that unbelievers ask, and it's the question that causes many unbelievers to become atheists to say there is no God. What's the big question? Here it is. How can or why does a God of love and justice allow this wickedness to continue? Right? 
I bet some of you have had this conversation. I bet some of you have had this conversation with an unsaved relative, a neighbor, or someone who says, you try to tell me that God is a God of love, that he's a God of justice, which means he does things right, that he's a God of mercy. And if that's so, how did he allow these two parents in Texas to murder their month-old baby? How can a God of love sit by and let that happen? How can a God of love and justice allow the genocide that's happening in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo between the, the, the Hema and the Lendu? How can a God of justice uh, allow the injustice that we see happening? How can he allow the oppression of the powerful over the weak? And for many unbelievers, they come to the conclusion that what? Therefore, God does not exist. They become an atheist and they say, if there was a God of love and justice and mercy that you claim, he would never allow this. So therefore, the only logical conclusion I can come to is that God does not exist. It's the big question. It's a big question for you and I, isn't it? Let's be honest, as Christians, many times we say, yeah, I didn't want to say anything, but I have the same question. I know we have the same question because a trial or a difficulty or something comes into our life and what's the first thing we often think? God, why? I'm doing my best for you. I'm trying to serve you. I'm trying to live for you. And, and this is what I get. I get this injustice. I get this trial. I get this difficulty. God, why is that? Sometimes people phrase the big question this way. Why do bad things happen to good people, right? Right? Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? You know, the first way I answer that question, or really I should say the first way the Bible answers that question, is in the form of a question that Jesus asked the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler said to Jesus, do you remember? He came to him and he addressed him and he said, good teacher, let me ask you a question. And do you remember what Jesus' first response was? Jesus said, why do you call me good? Why do you call me good? Jesus was seeking for this young man to recognize that he is God. That's why he's good, he's holy, he's perfect, he's just. But here's what the Bible says. When we ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Here's what the Bible says. Who are you calling good people? What is your definition of good people? Because the Bible actually says, how many good people are there? Zero. Romans 3.10, there is no one good, not even one. You see, our problem is we like to take our own definitions of what is good and what is not good. And so, of course, we're good. Every one of us in here thinks we're good compared to someone, right? We sat here this morning and heard of this young couple that allegedly, they're going to court now, but allegedly murdered their one-month-old baby. And if you were not indignant, if you were not shocked, what is wrong with you? And the temptation is to say, those are evil people. They're not good like me. And so I understand that under the sun, and the Bible says, yes, that under the sun, in, in human terms, there are degrees of evil, Right? But in God's terms, there is only good and bad. There is only righteous and sinner. And the reality is this. There are no good people. There are only sinners who have been saved by grace. There are only people who have been declared good because the righteousness of God has been applied to their life. So the first thing we need to understand is how and why does a God of love and justice allow this wickedness to continue? The big question we need to have, yep, we need to have a big answer. And Solomon says, I, I found the big answer. Did you notice it? He said it in verse, he said it in verse uh, 17. 
I know that God set the times for birth and for death. I know that God set the time for all this. So I realize that God has also set the time when he will judge the righteous and the wicked. And so the question is, why doesn't God do it right now? Why doesn't God do it right now? And Solomon said this, I also realize that this life under the sun is a testing grounds for man to see his true nature. And he says, his, our true nature is that we are but beasts or animals. Now, I, I, you have to understand here, he's not saying that, that we are the same in quantity, okay? Because man is created in the image of God, the animals are not. What he's saying is we, we are the same in reality. Just like an animal dies, physically dies, so you and I die. Because the one thing that you and I have in common with the animals is that we were all created by God. We're created from the dust of this earth. What happens when our physical body uh, dies? The same thing happens to our body that happens to the body of any animal. It decays and it goes back into its essential elements, which is what? The dust of this earth. One of the interesting things about this is, is we hear that. Your reaction should not be to that. That is really negative. The reaction to that is not to be depressing. The reaction to that should be centering for you. It should be grounding for you so that you approach this life from the right perspective. One of the interesting things for me, and I, I, I used to ask this question a lot. I've kind of stopped asking it now. But when I do a funeral service, one of the things I always do at the graveside, many of you have been here and have seen this, is I always make the sign of the cross upon the casket or upon the cremains out of sand or, or out of dirt. And I repeat this very phrase that Solomon repeats here that is repeated out elsewhere in Scripture, out of the dust you were created, unto the dust you shall return, and out of the dust, here's what's different from us than the animals, out of the dust, what? One day you will rise again. I, I've had to start supplying my own dirt and my own sand because years ago, the, the funeral homes always had it for me, and then I started to learn 20 years ago here, they go, ah, nobody does that anymore. And they've said, you're literally the only guy. The, the last one I had, they said they know one other guy in town. But they said, no one else does that anymore. They think it's too depressing. And I go, what? No, it's grounding. It's centering. It's a reminder that I am creation and he is creator. It's a reminder that this life is a vapor. That this life is short. What gives me significance in this life is not anything of myself, but because I am His and He is mine. And that's what brings me significance. And so Solomon said, this life is a testing ground for us to realize who we are. Number one, our true nature, which is we are creation, He is creator. And, and our moral nature, which is we are sinful, <laughs> And he is holy. The best of us, the best of us are still not good in God's definition of goodness and holiness. Apart from the righteousness of Jesus Christ, apart from his blood, which cleanses us from what? All unrighteousness. But that goodness is a declared goodness. It's not something we earn. It's not something we deserve. It's given to us as a gift from God. And so Solomon says this life, the reason God doesn't do the justice right now is because this life is a testing ground for man to see his true nature and turn to God for salvation. Do you realize, I, I used to say, I used to think that there would be so many more believers in this world, that there would be so many followers of God if if God worked like the cartoons, do you know what I mean by the cartoons? In a cartoon, at least in the ones I watched when I was growing up, remember what would happen when somebody would do something bad, something evil? Lightning would come down from heaven, right, and fry them. You know, they always recovered, but lightning would come down and zap them. What was that? That was the picture of like, okay, God's upset. You did something bad. If that actually happened, if, if this couple who allegedly murdered their one-month-old baby, if, if then the next day on the news was like, a uh, couple struck by lightning and killed after death of one-month-old baby, what would happen in our world? We'd go, yeah, not shocked, yeah. 
God says don't murder. God says don't take an innocent life. I mean, what were you expecting? I, I thought, oh, there'd be, there'd be so many more believers if that happened. But here's the reality. Why does God delay? Because God's desire is that... What's God's desire for this couple? I'm going to assume that they did it. We don't know. This is all very new. I'm going to assume that they did it. What's God's desire for this couple? For them to repent of their sins, to come to Him, and have life in His name. If He struck them dead the moment after they did this terrible thing, if He struck you and I dead the moment after we did a sin, there would be no chance for us to understand our true nature and turn to him for salvation so do not misunderstand that god does not deeply care about the oppressed that god does not deeply care about justice and mercy but what is happening is that god is giving a chance god desires that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth make no mistake justice will be done but here's what solomon says it's at the time that god has set at the time that God has set, he will right all wrongs. Justice will be done. I don't know why I'm having a problem with this today. Okay. Here, here's what it says in Jeremiah 23, 19 and 20. Will you read that together with me if you can see it? Behold, the storm of the Lord has gone forth in wrath, even a whirling tempest. It will swirl down on the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has performed and carried out the purposes of his heart. In the last days, you will clearly understand it. There's some things that Christians like to say that sound good, but they just happen to be unbiblical. And one of them is this. God hates the sin, but he loves the sinner, right? Mm, no, no. The wrath of God will be poured out on sinners one day. What does it say? I, look at that picture. It's going to swirl down on the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back. God loves us so much that he provided a way for sinners to be saved and be made righteous. But do not think that God is going to give a pass to the wicked someday who reject his salvation. There will be an accounting. Justice will be done because he is a God of justice and mercy. And for those of us that know him as Lord and Savior, we don't escape that judgment because we're good. We escape that judgment because by the grace of God and God alone, we've turned to him. And so the wrath that was due to us was poured out upon his son. Do you understand that? The wrath of God has come down on every sin that's ever happen that ever will happen either upon the head of those who do not repent and turn to him or he put it on his son on the cross in our place but the wrath of god for sin how do we sing in the song the wrath of god was satisfied the scripture also says sometimes people don't believe the old testament shame on you well, let's hear from the New Testament. Let's read this together. 1 Peter 3.12 For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Here's an encouragement for the Christian, for the believer. God knows the trials and difficulties. He knows the oppression, the injustices, the things that you have suffered because of envy in this dog-eat-dog -dog world and people that, that climb the social ladder and don't care who they step on on their way up to get there. God sees every one of those. He knows our tears and frustrations. His eyes are upon us he hears our prayers and he says one day he's going to revisit all those things see god just doesn't give him a pass one day he's going to make all those things right but the face of the lord is against those who do evil do you remember the blessing that god gave to moses to give to aaron to bless the people it's probably the most common benediction we know the lord bless you and keep you the lord what turn his face it's a symbol in the bible of when you are looking at someone face to face that's acceptance that's love that's blessing that's favor what does it say here god turns the face of the lord 
is turned away from those who do evil. A God of justice and love and mercy cannot stand the oppression and injustice, and it will be answered for someday. And so our sermon title for today, I give this to you at the end. So our sermon title for today is this. Living well in this world, living well under the sun, is knowing for certain that one day God will make right all of this world's injustices. Knowing for certain that one day God will make right all of this world's injustices. So Solomon ends with this. He says, so therefore, how should we live? He said, we should learn to live with a handful of quietness, one handful in tranquility and peace, knowing that God loves us. We shouldn't ride the roller coaster of ups and downs of trials and difficulties, but we should say God is in control. This too shall pass. I'm not going to stay on the mountain forever. I'm not going to be in the valley forever. This life is up and down in this hebel world, but but." I will be happy with a handful of quietness, of peace and mind, of soul and heart, because the one who knows me collects my tears. He knows my tears. He sees the injustices. He he knows the thing I suffer, and one day he will make those all right. But in the meantime, he wants as many as can to join us in becoming righteous, not because of anything we have done, but because of the blood of his Son. Amen.